हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Violence has flared up in the Indian state of Manipur again. This is after photos of two dead students went viral. The internet has been shut down one more time as India tries to resolve this crisis. Intelligence agencies are worried about another development thousands of miles away. The leader of a tribal outfit from Manipur was seen at a gurudwara in Canada. This has raised red flags. We'll bring you the details. Also a back story on Canada's relationship with Hardeep Singh Nijjar. His run-ins with the law and what Canada is trying to hide about his case. Meanwhile, the iPhone 15 is making headlines for all the wrong reasons. The new phone is overheating and breaking easily. We'll examine the claims. In China, a scientist says India's Chandrayaan did not land on the moon's south pole. In the US, Donald Trump missed another Republican Party debate and stole the limelight. The father of India's Green Revolution died today. We'll bring you his story. And a look at a new trend, rent a parent. What does it even mean? We'll tell you the headlines first. Nagorno-Karabakh will cease to exist from January 2024. The leader of the self-declared region says all state institutions will be dissolved starting next year. It was seized by Azerbaijan last week, leading to an exodus of the majority population of ethnic Armenians. Germany and Israel sign a missile shield deal and hail it as historic. Berlin will acquire the Israeli-made Arrow 3 hypersonic missile system. The deal is worth $3.5 billion. It is the largest deal in the history of Israel and its defense industry. Burkina Faso's military rulers say a coup bid has been foiled. Four people have been arrested in the latest coup attempt. Earlier this month, three soldiers were charged with plotting against the junta. Burkina Faso has been under military rule since January 2022. Oil prices cool after hitting the highest level in almost a year. Meanwhile, oil giant Saudi Aramco announces its first global liquefied natural gas deal. The company will acquire a minority stake worth $500 million in mid-ocean energy. The move is part of their broader bid to expand beyond oil. And goodbye Dumbledore, Harry Potter actor Michael Gambon is no more. He was best known for playing Professor Dumbledore in six of the eight Harry Potter films. The British actor was 82 years old. The state of Manipur is back in the news. Violence has erupted once again. And the reason is the same as the last time. A crime from the past has surfaced online. Let me explain. This week, Manipur's government lifted the internet ban. After five months, the state went online and immediately pictures began to circulate, pictures of two students, a 17-year-old girl and a 20-year-old boy. They had gone missing on the 6th of July this year. The families did approach the police. A complaint was filed two days later on the 8th. But there was no progress. The cops said both students had gone into a kooky-dominated area. And after that, no one saw them. Now, the Kukis are a tribal group in Manipur. They're locked in a violent face-off with another community, the Metes. More than 170 people have died so far. And this week, the two missing students joined that list. The viral picture showed their dead bodies. The male student was reportedly beheaded. The girl student was allegedly raped. As these pictures spread, so did the violence. Hundreds of people took to the streets. They marched towards the chief minister's residence. A standoff followed. Security officials used tear gas and smoke bombs. At least 50 students were injured. Some of them were hospitalized. The chief minister has condemned the twin murder. He has also transferred the case to the CBI. That's the Central Bureau of Investigation. A special CBI team has already arrived in Manipur. Also, internet connections have been cut again. The idea is to stop provocative content from being shared. But then again, how long can the ban continue? The first ban lasted for five months. Yet, the moment it was lifted, violence resumed. The government needs to understand this risk. Around 30 people are still reported missing in Manipur. That's the official count. We don't know what has happened to these people. 
if they're kidnapped, tortured or worse. So the fear is obvious. What if more such videos emerge? What if this violence becomes cyclical? That is the big worry. The government has decided to keep up the pressure. They've extended AFSPA in parts of Manipur. AFSPA is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. It gives additional powers to the army and the central forces. They can engage in arrest without warrants. The hill areas of Manipur have been placed under AFSPA, this Special Powers Act for the Armed Forces. The valley was not, has not, in fact. They remain under the state police. There is also talk of a new military strategy in the state. They're calling it One District, One Force. Each paramilitary force will be given districts. Say, the CRPF for one district, the army for another. Basically, there will be no overlapping. The idea is to boost cooperation and accountability. Manipur already has 40,000 security personnel. They're spread across the state. So resource is not the problem. But outside influence could be. A recent meeting in Canada has Indian intelligence worried. Khalistani separatists hosted a Manipur tribal leader. He was seen at a Gurudwara. Reports say he spoke about minority issues in India. Should New Delhi be worried about this? The details are sketchy right now. We don't know how deep the nexus is or if a nexus exists at all. But either way, it's proof of the uphill battle. The government says things are slowly returning to normal. But what does normal look like? The absence of violence is not normal. This episode is the perfect example of that. Manipur lifted the internet ban thinking that things had improved. But all it took was one picture. One picture and the violence resumed. What does that tell you? That ethnic divisions are yet to disappear, that the wounds have not healed. Only a comprehensive peace process can bring normalcy to Manipur. The government has promised that. It's now time to deliver. Trudeau versus India. It began 10 days ago. Justin Trudeau blamed India for the murder of a terrorist. In these 10 days, he has offered no proof. Tonight, we'll tell you what Canada is hiding. What is Ottawa's relationship with Niger? Why is there so much secrecy around his case? He has a long history of run-ins with the law. Why do Canadian ministers refuse to speak about it? Why does their police go silent when asked about Hardeep Singh Nijjar? Tonight, we bring you their backstory. Nijjar escaped to Canada in 1996. He was in legal trouble in India. He was named in multiple terror cases. In the 80s and 90s, Nijjar was linked with a group called KCF, the Khalistan Commando Force a terrorist organization pushing for a separate Sikh state. In 1995, they assassinated Bayan Singh. He was the chief minister of Punjab. They killed him. Nijjar was not named in this case, but he was linked to the killers. So he fled. In Canada, he engaged in more Khalistani activities. By the year 2012, he was linked with the Khalistan Tiger Force, KTF. That's another banned terrorist group. He was found, it was founded by a man called Jagdar Singh Tara. He was behind the assassination of Bayant Singh, this man. And Nijjar is said to have been his friend. Later, he went on to lead the group, the KTF. India gathered all this proof against him. Indian agencies said Nijjar used Canadian soil to plan attacks, to fund terrorists, and to give arms training against India. And New Delhi raised this matter with Ottawa. The issue blew up in the year 2016. That's when a report emerged. It revealed the full extent of Nijjar's terrorist activities. He had set up a camp in British Columbia to train a small group of Sikh youth. Nijjar was teaching them how to use guns, including AK-47s. India prepared a report and shared it with Canada. This report said, and I'm quoting, Nijjar has been imparting arms training to his group in Canada after the arrest of former KTF chief Jagtar Tara, in Thailand by Interpol last year. He took Mandeep Singh and three more Sikh youths recently for AK-47 training in a range near Mission, where they were made to fire for four hours daily. This is the input that India gave to Canada, this report. Canadian lawmakers faced questions about it. Do you know what their response was? No comments. It did not matter who you asked. Everyone was tight-lipped in Canada, including Trudeau's ministers. 
Ralph Goodale was Canada's public safety minister then. He was asked about Niger. Listen to his response. I'm quoting again. Wherever there is a credible threat to the police and security authorities of Canada, respond appropriately in robust ways. Whatever action needs to be taken is to be taken. Evasive and non-committal. That's what he's being. What about the police? The Royal Canadian Mounted Police or RCMP. They were asked about Niger, and here's what they said. Not in a position to speak to specific allegations, threats, or ongoing investigations. In other words, no comments. Even Canada's Justice Department refused to speak. They were asked about Niger's extradition, if they'd received any extradition requests for Niger. Response, no comment. We can neither confirm nor deny this. That's what they said, the judicial authorities. Nidjar too spoke about this case. He said that he is a Canadian citizen, just a plumber. There is nothing on his record, and he called the claims garbage. He also wrote to Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, pleading innocence. It was all very shady, and it was about to get worse. In April 2018, Nidjar had another run-in with the law. He was taken into custody. The Canadian law enforcement detained him for 24 hours. It's not clear on what grounds. The police refused to speak. All they said was no charges had been filed. Guess who was Nidjar's lawyer in this case? Gurpatwan Singh Pannu, another Khalistani terrorist, member of Sikhs for Justice. It's also a banned outfit. He regularly features in videos spewing hate about India and issuing threats against Indian leaders. Last week, Indian investigators seized his properties in Punjab. So Pannu was Nidjar's lawyer, which is not strange at all two Khalistanis helping each other. But the studied silence of Canada is very strange. The secrecy around the whole affair, the allegations against Nidjar, the extradition request in 2016, the detention in 2018, ask them anything about any of these things, and you will hit a wall. So I repeat the question, what are they trying to hide? We went through all of their statements from 2016 to 2018. They do not deny anything. They just refuse to comment. So we wrote to the Canadian police ourselves, asking about Nidjar's detention. They replied, but they did not answer our question. The same authorities are now probing Nidjar's death, and again, secrecy prevails. The new iPhone is getting a lot of attention. Not the good kind, though. Users say the phone is too hot to handle. And no, they're not being figurative. The criticism is literal. Apparently, the iPhone 15 has an overheating problem. It pops up from time to time, like when you fast charge or play video games for a long time or record 4K videos. Now, just to be clear, not every iPhone 15, 15 user is complaining about this, but even then it could be trouble. iPhones make up around 50% of Apple's revenue, so they need iPhone 15 to succeed. With that said, let's look at the problem. How much is the iPhone heating up? One YouTuber said he clocked 116 degrees Fahrenheit. That's more than 46 degrees Celsius. What's the normal range for phones? Ideally, it should be around 36. But anything up to 43 is acceptable, which means the iPhone 15 has gone over. Do we know why? Well, so far, there are only theories. Some users have blamed the new microprocessor chip. Others have blamed the titanium frame. A few have also blamed the engineering. So which one is it? The chip claim is a hard sell. Only the pro models of iPhone 15 use the new chip. But overheating has been reported in other models too. So it can't be the chip. Could it be the titanium frame? On paper, titanium does affect thermal efficiency. So we cannot rule that out. But prominent experts have settled on engineering. Apparently, Apple made some compromises in the thermal design system, like the space available for heat to dissipate. Maybe that's causing the overheating. The fact is we can't be sure. For all we know, this is all temporary because no phone can be judged in the first couple of days. You're usually copying data, installing new apps, trying out new things. All of it can cause overheating. So how is Apple planning to deal with it? They are bringing a new software, a software update to iPhone 15. But it's a risky play. Experts say Apple may have to lower processor performance, basically slow it down. And if that happens, customers will not be happy. 
And this is the software side of things. But what if the problem is with the hardware, with the engineering or the frame? Well, good luck then. Our suggestion is buy a phone cover. There are other problems too with the new iPhone, like durability. Some users say it breaks too easily. Take a look at this. Just a reminder, that phone is worth more than $1,000, but look how easily it broke. All it took was a hard press. Could this be because of the titanium frame? You see, models before iPhone 15 do not use titanium. They use stainless steel. Apple changed it for durability. Titanium is supposed to be lighter and stronger than stainless steel, but clearly it's not working. Some users conducted drop tests on iPhone 15 and 14. They said the older model did better. The 15 was completely unusable after a couple of drops. Another issue is fingerprints. Again, blame titanium for that. Dirt and blemishes are more common on this model. They stay on longer as well. Apple also says the color could change. And this is interesting. Your fingers have oil in them. You use these fingers to hold and support your phone. As a result, the titanium could change color. Apple says this is temporary. Just wipe off the fingerprints and the color will return. But that's a lot of wipes every single day, especially after paying $1,000. Some iPhone 15s also come with defects like dirt on cameras, scratches on the screen, and damage on the edges. You don't expect this from Apple's flagship product. So what's happening here? Has Apple dropped the ball? Well, the sales are still going strong. If anything, Apple is struggling to keep up with the demand. But such things can escalate quickly. If the issues persist, it could be trouble for Apple, especially in the current market. Companies like Samsung and Google are making big strides. Just look at Japan. It's one of the largest iPhone markets in the world. Last year, they made up 58% of all sales. And now, 46%. Meanwhile, Google's Pixel phone has taken off. They make up 12% of all sales. That's around six times higher than last year. So Apple cannot be complacent. Customers may accept lack of innovation, but they will not accept defects. Now let's talk about China. Yesterday, there was an important meeting in Beijing. China's top decision-making body met. It's called the Politburo. Xi Jinping was there. China's defense minister, Li Shangfu, was expected to show up too. But he did not, because he's still missing. In fact, Lee has been missing since August this year. Almost a month, no sign of him. China has not bothered to address this, let alone explain the disappearance. And just like the last time, Lee's absence is fueling rumors. There is growing scrutiny. The PLA could be going through a purge. Again, no official confirmation, but reports say the Chinese army is facing a crackdown. China's military is controlled by a special body. It's called the Central Military Commission, or CMC. This is the apex decision-making body, the top decision-making body in China. Xi Jinping chairs it himself. Now, some cadres of the CMC are under investigation. This is also according to reports. We cannot confirm this. But here's what we can. Something is amiss. PLA's officials have received instructions. They've been asked to, quote-unquote, purify their social circle. What does that mean? It means be careful about who you associate with. That's what military officials have been advised in China. In fact, I have a quote from the PLA Daily. It's the military's news website. This is what it says. The most effective way to stay away from dangers and temptations is to conduct physical isolation. Now, this report further says that some leaders have been removed because they, and I'm quoting, socialized with the wrong people. Leaders have been removed because they socialized with the wrong people. Are they talking about the defense minister of China here? There is a strong possibility they are because Li Shangfu is not your average general. He was handpicked by Xi Jinping, just like Ching Gang, the foreign minister who went missing. He was subsequently sacked. Now, Ching Gang was a loyalist too, a trusted aide who worked by Xi Jinping's side. He rose through the ranks quite swiftly, and his downfall was even faster. It is believed that Qin was punished for an affair. 
What about Lee Shang Fu, the defense minister? He is under investigation for corruption. Before becoming defense minister, he led military procurement in China from 2017 to 2022, and now his stint is under scrutiny. So there is a shake-up, especially in the PLA, but it has not moderated their aggression against neighbors. In fact, they're doubling down in the South China Sea. Chinese soldiers are pressing their claims. There is a navigation warning. Beijing wants to start fresh military exercises. It is asking other ships to stay away. In recent months, tensions have escalated. China has been locking horns with the Philippines. This is over the Scarborough Shoal. Again, this is in the South China Sea. Both Beijing and Manila claim it, but China seized it, seized the shoal in 2012. It installed a floating barrier here. This was to block ships from the Philippines. This week, Manila dismantled the barrier and Beijing responded with a threat. The so-called statement by the Philippine side is entirely self-serving. China firmly upholds the sovereignty and maritime rights and interests of the Huangyang Island. We advise the Philippine side to refrain from making provocations or seeking trouble. What about China's own provocations? From the Himalayas to the high seas and now the internet, Chinese hackers have breached the U.S. State Department. They've targeted emails of diplomats and they've managed to steal thousands of emails. We have some numbers. At least 10 email accounts were targeted and some 60,000 emails were stolen. We don't have names of the victims, but we can tell you that these emails belong to the State Department's officials. Nine of them worked on East Asia and the Pacific and one of them worked on Europe. And this breach was first reported in the month of July. Back then, the extent of the damage was not clear. But now the U.S. has a better understanding. The breach compromised sensitive information, they say. The Chinese hackers stole a whole lot of data, travel itineraries, diplomatic deliberations, even social security numbers. What's a social security number? It's like an Aadhaar number in India, a nine-digit unique number that enables personal identification of individuals. Chinese hackers stole all of this. So while Xi Jinping is making his ministers disappear and cracking down on his army, there is no let up in China's nefarious activities. The security threat is only escalating. So China's cabinet is looking a bit shaky, but their propaganda machine seems absolutely fine. Their latest target is India's moon landing. Last month, Chandrayaan-3, of India landed on the lunar south pole. We saw it, you saw it, chances are the whole world saw it. But China says, not so fast. A top Chinese scientist is disputing India's claim. His name is Ouyang Ziwan. He's considered to be the father of China's lunar program. So he's one of the best that they have. And what is he saying? That India did not land on the south pole. In fact, let me quote his statement. The landing site of Chandrayaan-3 is not at the lunar south pole, not in the lunar south pole region, nor is it near the lunar south pole region. Then where is it? Now this could get complicated. So listen closely. Like the Earth, the Moon also has latitudes. These are imaginary horizontal lines that run across the surface. These lines help help in marking locations. The equator, for example, is a latitude. It represents zero degrees. The equator is zero degrees. Up north and south, you have the poles. These are 90 degrees. Now let's apply this to the moon as well. Where did India's Chandrayaan land? At 69 degrees south latitude. The Chinese scientist says, this is not the South Pole region. Then what is? According to him, the polar region is much narrower, between 88.5 and 90 degrees. So that's further south. Now, does this argument make sense? Well, it's a highly technical argument, also a political one. Did any other space agency talk about this latitude stuff? They did not. The NASA chief said, India landed on the lunar south pole. So did the European Space Agency. Then why is China playing spoil sport? Here on Earth, 69 degrees is considered as polar region. But on the Moon, it's different. Why is that? Because the Earth is more tilted than the Moon. So the polar region is narrow. At least that's what the Chinese scientist says. Like I said, it's all very technical. But the fact is, India landed where no other country did. 
near the South Pole and China's disagreement is not scientific, it is political. India hit the target first. So now China is shifting the goalpost. It's pretty childish to be honest. But then again, it's classic China. We told you about their racist meltdown yesterday. Made in China, iPhone, made in India iPhones, made the Chinese insecure. So you can imagine what the moon landing did to them. With Chandrayaan-3, India had three active spacecraft around the moon. The propulsion module, the lander, and the orbiter from Chandrayaan-2. The second Chandrayaan mission failed, but the orbiter is still working. Compare that to China, they have just one active spacecraft around the moon. Beijing would not have liked that. Equally important was the timing. Chandrayaan-3 landed during the BRICS summit. Prime Minister Modi and President Xi were in Johannesburg. Everyone rushed to congratulate Prime Minister Modi. The South African president apparently wanted to sit next to him. Xi Jinping would not have liked that. China state media betrayed that insecurity. Just look at their commentary on India's moon landing. This is what they're saying. China is far more advanced in various aspects. China's lunar rover is much bigger, weighing 140 kilograms compared to India's 26 kilograms. Additionally, India's Pragyan cannot withstand the lunar nights. By contrast, China's rover holds the record for working the longest time on the lunar surface. How about that? Your neighbor has just landed on the moon's south pole, the first country to do so. And what does China state media do? Release an article on why China is better. So this latest claim by China's top scientist is not surprising. If anything, it's a bit late. India never tried to hide its landing location. ISRO always said around 70 degrees south. And that's, wh that's where it landed. My point is, deferring perceptions cannot take, take away from India's achievement. The world has accepted it. So our advice to China would be this. Your scientists are so keen on latitudes and locations on the moon. Maybe use that skill on Earth too, not to disparage other countries, but to find your missing ministers and to respect the boundaries of your neighbors. The Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. It's an iconic site in California, a must visit for any tourist heading there. Every four years, it hosts the Republican presidential primary debate. It's what many call the Super Bowl of Republican debates. For Republicans, it's a rite of passage. It's here that they have to convince their party that they can win the White House. Since 1984, this debate has been a yardstick for the US. It's how Republicans measure their candidates. But this time, the picture was a little different. Six men and one woman took the stage in California. They flashed broad smiles. They waved to the audience. They bickered and spoke over each other. But the spotlight was not on them. It was on Donald Trump, the former president, who decided to skip the debates. Instead, he was in Michigan rallying auto workers. It's all over television, this speech. You know, we're competing with the job candidates. They're all running for a job. No, they're all job candidates. They want to be in the, uh, they want to tell do anything. Secretary of something. That's Donald Trump for you. He doesn't even care about the debate. He skipped the first one. His ratings did not fall. He skipped the second one. It's unlikely that his lead will change. Trump thinks he's so far ahead in the race that he doesn't need to debate. So he's skipping the debates. But what about his fellow Republicans? They know what they're up against. And they will need to do something significant to catch up, which is why this time the attacks got more personal. They did bicker among each other, but they also came together to target Trump. You're not here tonight because you're afraid of being on the stage and defending your record. You're ducking these things. And let me tell you what's going to happen. You keep doing that, no one up here is going to call you Donald Trump anymore. We're going to call you Donald Duck. And you know who else is missing in action? Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record where they added 7.8 trillion to the debt. That set the stage for the inflation that we have. Some pot shots there. But is, it is really hard to level a blow on a candidate that is 3,000 kilometers away. So let's look at the winners and the losers of this debate. The biggest loser this time was Vivek Ramaswamy. He did remarkably well in the last debate. 
You could love him or hate him, but you could not ignore him then. But this time, Ramaswamy was lackluster at best. He did say some controversial things, but most of it did not land. Plus, his rivals made him the punching bag. They attacked everything from his business to his policy ideas. Well, first, let me say I'm glad, I'm glad Vivek uh, pulled out of his business deal in 2018 in China. That must have been about the time you decided to start voting in presidential elections. So okay. we're hey, nice I'm to have you participating in, in elections. So Ramaswamy did not do so well, which brings us to the winners. There were two of them. One was Ron DeSantis. He did terribly in the first debate, but this time he seemed fierce and confident. And he started off by attacking Trump. The former president, um, you know, he's missing in action tonight. He's had a lot to say about that. He should be here explaining his comments to try to say that pro-life protections are somehow a terrible thing. I want him to look into the eyes and tell people who've been fighting this fight for a long time. So Ron, Ron DeSantis did well, but the biggest winner was not even present there. The biggest winner of this debate was Donald Trump. He's leading by 40 points right now. Both Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy are nowhere near him. So even those blows on stage are not affecting him. You can call him Donald Duck, but it doesn't affect his lead. It doesn't change the fact that Republicans are rallying behind Trump. A recent survey asked Republicans who is the best U.S. president, who was the best U.S. president in the last 40 years. 41% of them chose Ronald Reagan. 37% said Donald Trump. Neither of them were at the two-hour two debate here but both of them shaped it. The Republican Party was once seen as Reagan's party. 30 years later, the GOP has become Trump's party. He writes the rules for it, to, for it now. Now let's turn our attention to the UK. British Home Secretary Suella Braverman is at it again. She's come up with a new way to further her refugee repulsing agenda one that's drawn almost universal condemnation. Braverman's latest gaffe took place in Washington instead of Westminster. On Monday, she gave a speech there, a speech on how to stop asylum seekers. Her actual attempts to stop refugees to the UK have failed miserably. So she proposed a novel solution. Just change the definition of refugee. Talk about shifting goalposts. According to Braverman, any woman or person from the LGBTQ community can claim asylum. They can just apply by saying they fear persecution. She says that needs to change, that the entire definition of refugee needs an overhaul. Her arguments were devoid of compassion and context, and they've drawn flag from across the board. Here's a report. Suella Braverman, the British Home Secretary of Indian origin, a child of migrants whose mission is to keep migrants out of the British Isles. Braverman's days seem to be filled with obsessing about small boats. She also once claimed she dreams about packing off refugees to Rwanda. And it seems she's all consumed by the problem of migration. I think most members of the public would recognize those fleeing a real risk of death, torture, oppression or violence as being in need of protection. Let me be clear, there are vast swathes of the world where it is extremely difficult to be gay or to be a woman. Where individuals are being persecuted, it is right that we offer sanctuary. But we will not be able to sustain an asylum system if in effect simply being gay or a woman or fearful of discrimination in your country of origin is sufficient to qualify for protection. These are parts of her speech addressed to a think tank in Washington. Let's break down her point. Women and gay people facing death, torture or oppression should be given refuge. But those who merely fear these horrors should be kept away. Braverman basically said, don't come to the UK unless you're being shot at. She thinks that if you're living a miserable life because your government hates who you are, tough luck. As you can imagine, that line of thinking has faced a backlash. The UN's refugee agency has rebuked her, and many have questioned her lack of compassion. But Braverman is standing by her statement. She has also offered her solution. The extent to which the global asylum framework enables the obscuring of these categories creates huge incentives for illegal migration. This legal framework is rooted in the 1951 UN Refugee Convention. 
It was created to help resettle people fleeing persecution following the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust and was, initially at least, centred around Europe. It is therefore incumbent upon politicians and thought leaders to ask whether the Refugee Convention and the way it has come to be interpreted through our courts is fit for our modern age or in need of reform. Braverman said refugee laws are based on the 1951 UN Convention. She says it needs to be updated. Technically, it was updated in 1967. That was to include non-European refugees. But that's not the kind of update she wants. Instead of it becoming more humanitarian, Braverman wants the world to become more unforgiving. Braverman's own parents migrated to the UK. Her father is of Goan origin. His family was settled in Kenya, a former British colony. Braverman's mother is from Mauritius, another place with a lot of Indian origin citizens. Both Braverman's parents came to the UK in the 1960s. They were fleeing turmoil in former European colonies. That the UK allowed them in was a rare act of grace by a colonizer. And Braverman's family made the most of it. Her mother was a nurse who eventually became a politician. And Suella Braverman has followed those footsteps. It's a great success story. And it was only possible because her family sought refuge in the UK and received it. So considering her own family history, it's quite hypocritical for Braverman to deny that same opportunity to others. She says people migrating for economic reasons shouldn't be allowed, that people facing discrimination should also be stopped. It seems she'll only accept those who are fleeing death, no one else. But look at why migrants are fleeing in the first place. Countries like the UK spent centuries colonizing and impoverishing nations. In recent years, the West has conducted wars around the world. Innocent people get affected, their lives get upturned. Some can't recover even after the Western forces leave. In this case, isn't it the West's responsibility to try and make up for the devastation they've caused? Braverman doesn't seem to think so. Her rhetoric shows just how far the UK has drifted from reason and responsibility, and how she has forgotten the opportunities her own family received. The year was 1942. Mahatma Gandhi gave a call for Quit India, a movement launched during the Second World War, demanding an end to British rule in India. Right after that, in 1943, the Bengal famine was wreaking havoc. It was a man-made famine, a consequence of British policies during the war. It resulted in about two to three million deaths in India. A lot was happening. Many students in India found themselves asking the same question. What can we do for our country? Among them was a young man, M.S. Swaminathan. He belonged to the Indian state of Tamil Nadu. His father was a doctor. Swaminathan wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. But after the famine, he gave up the plan. Instead, he began studying agriculture and went on to become a legendary scientist, a world-renowned agronomist. He is hailed as the father of India's Green Revolution. It completely changed India's agricultural landscape. Today, he took his last breath. He died at the age of 98. While the entire country grieves his death, we must also celebrate him. Though he was known to be soft-spoken, Swaminathan could be persistent. Over a career spanning seven decades, he steadily built one of history's most formidable careers in crop science. He got his shoes muddy in farms. He strained his eyes in laboratories. He served in senior executive positions in Indian government agencies. He was part of agricultural research institutes. He took part in prestigious commissions, both at home and abroad. He rebuked pessimistic projections about India. During the mid-1900s, experts said low yields and high population growth would be India's downfall, that it would lead to mass starvation. Swaminathan said people claimed Indians had no future unless a thermonuclear bomb kills them. Others said Indians would die like sheep going to a slaughterhouse. To that, Swaminathan said, we decided this would not happen. And he saw it through. You see, post-independence, Indian agriculture was not very productive. Years of colonial rule had stunted the growth. During the first two decades of independence, Swaminathan made massive scientific contributions, both on and off the field. 
In the early 1960s, India's wheat production was languishing. It stood at about 10 million tons. Rice production was suffering too. India's output was 35 million tons. This forced the country to import huge quantities of grain. In 1966, imports crossed 10 million tons. Why was the production so bad? The wheat and rice crops in India were not high yielding. And this is where Swaminathan came in. He specialized in crop genetics and breeding. He worked on improving the variety of crop. And it had a wide impact. This is what led to the Green Revolution. Swaminathan introduced a new kind of rice and wheat plant. High yield varieties of paddy and wheat were developed. And the rest, as they say, is history. Wheat production doubled in just a few years. By the end of the decade, it had, it had crossed 20 million tons. And today, India is a farming powerhouse. Its entire economy is supported by agriculture. Agriculture contributes to 16% of India's GDP today. And India is one of the world's largest and most diversified food producers. It's the second largest producer of rice, wheat, oil seeds, fruits, vegetables, sugarcane, and cotton. In the last one year, India has produced some 330 million tons of food grain. The wheat output alone was a record 112 million tons. In August, India's rice production stood at 134 million tons. Since the Green Revolution, India has achieved food grain self-sufficiency. Today, India accounts for 40% of the global rice trade. By 2030, agriculture could contribute around $600 billion to India's GDP. That's a 50% increase since 2020. And one can't help but say that the catalyst behind all of this was Swaminathan. Within a span of decades, India went on from depending on grain imports to becoming one of the world's leading food producers and exporters. Swaminathan has inspired generations of scientists the world over. His Green Revolution was not just a scientific achievement, it was a survival strategy. Much like a mother's infinite love, capitalism is a gift that keeps on giving. And this time, it's offering a mother's care and attention quite literally. I'm talking about outsourcing parenting. It's the new trend. Rent a parent. It was birthed during the pandemic, and now it has sprung up across college campuses in the U.S. Some parents are paying women to provide parenting services to their kids, college-age kids, mind you. A so-called college mom will make your child's bed, bring them food, and share parental advice, all for a couple of thousand dollars. The question is, can they also turn people's offsprings into fully functioning adults? People aren't so sure. Here's a report. Going off to college is a transformative experience, especially for those who must live away from home. Adulting is thrust upon you. Suddenly, you're eating nothing but instant noodles. All your white clothes are magically turning pink. And you find yourself falling asleep to a very noisy refrigerator. It's an exciting but chaotic time for most. And sometimes, or maybe often if we're being honest, you end up missing home-cooked food. You miss the days when neatly folded clothes somehow transported themselves to the closet. It may have sounded blasphemous to your teenage self, but even helicopter parenting is dearly missed. If you're struggling with this, fear not. Capitalism has just the answer for you. A bonus mom. No, wait, we mean a proxy helicopter parent. Wait, correction. Simply put, an outsourced parent. Don't worry, this isn't a sales pitch. We're simply trying to keep up with Gen Z. Now, if only that could be outsourced. But coming back to the story, parents are paying people, well, who are we kidding? They're paying women to provide parenting service to their college-going children. Yes, parenting service to fully grown adults. College moms are making a child's bed, bringing them soup and medicines when they're unwell, serving them lunch, and even giving them hugs. All the maternal love and care for a fee of about $10,000 a year. Now, don't expect cash bailouts, snarky responses to tales of your love life, or funny cat WhatsApp forwards. This service includes all kinds of traditional parenting duties, like setting up a child's dorm room, taking a college-age kid to a doctor's appointment, or sharing relationship advice. Now, most would cringe from taking advice from parents, 
But maybe when it's a fake parent, children don't mind as much. In fact, many say their college moms have been really helpful. This proxy parenting was birthed during the pandemic, when parents were unable to reach their children in far-flung campuses. Since then, many parenting services have sprung up across college campuses. But while these businesses have become popular, this trend has sparked a debate. Many ask, how will these kids become fully functional adults if they're treated like helpless children? They are bound to be met with crushing disappointment after graduation. Or maybe they would have developed crippling mommy issues if they didn't already suffer from them. Fact is, children aren't often taught enough life skills. And this is not to blame the parents. The education system is at fault too. Children know all about mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Or about the Pythagoras theorem. But what about cooking a decent hot meal? What about stitching a loose button on a shirt? Young adults focus on getting the perfect score in tests, but don't know the ABCs of money management or about basic health and hygiene. So, while rent-a-parent is bizarre, it's very much in business because many young adults need all the help they can get. But here's the catch. A fake mom can look after domestic matters or deal with emotional drama, but she cannot raise a fully functional child. That's simply way above the pay grade. And while the maternal load may never cease to end, it also can't completely be outsourced. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Brazil, a drought has killed thousands of fish in the Amazon. In London, the world's first ice cream made of plastic was unveiled. But the big question is, will you eat it? It looks like diplomacy isn't just about serious stuff or serious business. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken showed off his guitar chops as he launched a new initiative of music diplomacy. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1928. Scottish medical researcher Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. The discovery itself was accidental. Fleming found mold growing on a Petri dish when he returned from a holiday. This led to the development of penicillin before antibiotics. Even minor infections were incurable and even deadly. Penicillin became the first effective antibiotic in the world. We're leaving you with that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. And if this doesn't clear the house, I don't know what. <laughs>